being timely, we'll start when we said we would start. I'm Jim Hojack. I'm the Chief of Child and Lesson Psychiatry at the Lerner College of Medicine and at the University of Vermont Medical Center. And I also have a hobby called the UVM Wellness Environment that uh, I spend a fair amount of time on. I'm just giving you some context because I run the center that Dr. Swift works in and I'll make references both to that center and uh, to the wellness environment while I introduce this uh, incredible person. First and foremost, uh, apart from being blessed that she works in our center and teaches in our program, Dr. Swift is a Vermonter. She came up in Barrie um, and uh, no, no end of humor for me when I'm working with, Sam, with uh, Pam when she gives me that Barry glare. I know right where it came from. <laughs> I bet everybody knows that. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> Barry, the Barry glare is well known. Uh, Spalding High School. Then she went to the University of Vermont and uh, distinguished herself in her undergrad work in psychology. Then went to uh, West Virginia in Morgantown to pursue the study of uh, young children whose lives go sideways and then a PhD uh, and a fine dissertation looking at kids who, uh, whose lives include, include law breaking and, and criminal behavior. Um, she has told me privately after doing that important work, she knew that uh, she wanted to do something else. Uh, <laughs> and we were blessed to have her come back and do an internship in our center shared uh, with the Connecting Cultures program run by uh, Masha Ivanova and Karen Fondataro. And then I was lucky enough to get her to do a postdoctoral uh, program with us where she is an incredible clinician, takes care of some of the most needy children and adolescents in our center, um, and is an extraordinary teacher, as you will see on your own today. In the uh, wellness environment, she is, teaches courses on sleep and on concussion and on the impact of substance use on children's brain. Um, but more than anything, uh, I value her as a colleague who has taught me that the four hours I was getting is probably not enough. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to, to welcome my colleague, Pam Swift. Thank you. Is everybody here this okay? Okay, excellent. Thank you for that welcome, Jim. I appreciate it. Um, just to kind of give you all a little bit of background, and thank you all for being here tonight, too. I know there's overflow seating upstairs, and people are watching um, on streaming, so I appreciate your interest in this topic. Um, sleep is what I would call my soapbox topic. Um, during grad school, when we would interview students to join our graduate program, we would always ask them, like, what is the thing you get up on your soapbox about? Um, and I, after undergraduate and not taking good care of my sleep, I realized that this is very much my thing that I care a lot about um, and that I've put a lot of resources and time into changing for myself and then researching um, in a variety of different manners. Um, within my graduate program, I worked for a period of time in our uh, sleep research laboratory um, with Dr. Holly Montgomery Downs, primarily doing research on pediatric sleep disordered breathing um, and postpartum sleep as well. And, I am also about to go back into that realm of postpartum sleep. So and I apologize for my footwear. It is what is comfortable right now. I'm sorry. I would usually wear heels, um, but we're just we're getting through. Um, the other thing that really, you know, I feel really privileged to do um, within my work right now is focusing on these domains of wellness that we talk about within our clinic. Um, sleep is one of those domains that we talk about a lot, and it was an area that you know, there wasn't too, too much, um, you know, faculty interest in at the time, or there wasn't too much research in. And so I was really happy to come into this spot within the VCCYF and take over um, that area of, of, of expertise. Um, so briefly, you'll see you have like letters in front of you. Um, so the Lerner College of Medicine has really taken a focus on active learning in the past year or so. Um, and this is kind of their definition of active learning, right? So active learning methods rely on engagement to construct knowledge as opposed to me just standing here and talking at you. Um, so, you know, rather than passively absorbing it, hopefully you're kind of participating in it too. Um, so, you know, the way that we're going to work this in through our talk is um, we'll do pre and post questions um, as we go through some of these topics. Um, so we'll have some true and false questions. We'll have some um, uh, multiple choice questions. When I have a true and false for you, I'll just ask you to raise your hand if you think it's true. 
Um, and then the multiple choice, you can see the cards in front of you, so you can spend a minute kind of, or like 30 seconds or so probably, um, talking to your neighbor, talking to those around you, um, formulating some kind of answer, and then we'll check in at the end of the topic too. So to test this out, true or false, my name is Pamela Swift. <laughs> good, I like it, good, good participation. Um, and then you're understanding what are we going to be learning about tonight. Are we going to be talking about what sleep is, why we sleep, how much sleep we need, or hopefully all of the above? All of the above, which I'm going to warn you is a lot. Um, so I'm sorry if I speak really quickly, but I want to make sure we have the chance to like get questions in at the end. Um, so it's, it's a fine balancing act. All right, so let's get into that first one. So what is sleep? Um, so I asked my students this a lot, I ask my patients this a lot when we're starting out with sleep treatment. Um, so these are the kinds of answers that I typically get in response. So lack of consciousness, so we go unconscious when we're sleeping. Lack of wakefulness, so we're resting, we're relaxing. Uh, dreaming is associated with sleep, of course, and it's typically associated with one portion or one stage of our sleep cycle. Uh, muscle paralysis, so you lose muscle tone during certain parts of sleep. Uh, we describe REM, or sleep as being these two different categories, so REM and non-REM, which we'll go into extensively in a couple slides. Um, we know there's a circadian rhythm or some kind of cycle associated with sleep and with wakefulness. I also have my students tell me that, yeah, it's probably super important. That's why I'm up here talking about it. And then regularly, my students and patients are telling me that they're not getting enough sleep. And that is typically true of American populations. Um, something like 52, 53% of Americans are not getting as much sleep as they think they need. Um, in the UK, it's even higher. I think it's like 68%. So we're not the worst, um, but we're definitely struggling as adults, especially with sleep. So we know that sleep accounts for about a third of our existence. So if our, you know, you've probably heard the adage, you need sleep to sleep eight hours a night. If you divide that across your 24 hours of the day, then about a third of your life is spent sleeping. It's incredibly important and vital because it plays a role in nearly every physiologic, every psychological process that you can think of. Um, so, and it is subsequently affected by those processes too. So if you're thinking about immune system functioning, cardiac functioning, those things are influenced by how much you're sleeping and vice versa. And then when we're thinking about like psychological disorders, there's a number of psychological disorders that have some issue of sleep in their criteria. Um, so depression, for instance, you could be sleeping too much or too little. Um, PTSD is associated with nightmares and troubles with sleep. If we want to put it really succinctly, then sleep is this biological state that consists of REM and non-REM. Again, we'll talk about those in a second. Um, but it's also defined by these behavioral phenomenon too. So there has to be minimal movement. There has to be a typical sleep position. So for humans, we're typically laying down while we sleep. Um, you can be supine on your back, you can be on your side, you can be on your belly, but we're typically laying down. It has to involve some reduced responsiveness to stimuli. So if I came up and whispered, you might not wake up. All of those things could also be indicative of coma. Um, you know, they could also be indicative, if none of those things are happening, they could be death. Um, so we need to have this last one here. It has to be reversible. You have to be able to get somebody out of that state with some kind of intense stimuli. You know, depending on how deep in sleep you are, it might be something less intense, like just saying somebody's name or, you know, shutting a door. Um, if it's more of a deep sleep, of, uh, deep stage of sleep, you might have to do like sternal rubs even or something, depending on how deep they're sleeping. But you can reverse it. We know that all mammals have REM and non-REM sleep to some degree. So otters do sleep like this. It's adorable. They hold hands. They, you know, they make sure they're not losing their buddy. Elephants and my daughter sleep like this. Uh, so they like to kind of like, you know, put their butts up, they're sleeping on their faces. Um, the one exception to this rule, because there's always one, are echidnas. Echidnas are like those really weird kind of mammals. They're small, they have really long noses. They lay eggs. They're like not like mammals for a lot of reasons, but they're classified as mammals. They do not have REM sleep. Um, so there are one exception to that rule. But every other mammal has REM and non-REM sleep. And most, a lot of other animals do as well. Um, so jellyfish, there's some evidence that jellyfish may be sleeping, um, which, yeah, go figure. Um, one thing that's really important to think about is that if sleep does not serve 
some sort of vital absolute function, then this is a huge mistake. Because evolutionarily, you're putting yourself at a lot of risk while you're sleeping. If you think about like how you've grown, you know, how we as humans have grown and developed, you are at a lot of risk by putting yourself to bed. Um, same with some of these animals, uh, these mammals here. Um, you know, elephants have a number of prey that could attack them during sleep. Elephants have very strange sleeps. They sleep for maybe two hours total over the course of 24 hours, and they're only sleeping in very small spurts, so maybe like 30 minutes at a time. But all animals have adapted some kind of way to get through this rest and active state um, and to get some kind of function from sleep. What that is is not clear. Um, so there's a lot of different theories for why we might sleep. One of them is restoration or recovery. Um, so we could be clearing out some toxins. We could be clearing out some things that our brain is building up over the course of the day and just kind of restoring us to baseline. Um, so some you know, evidence for this that came out a little more recently is that there is this protein that's encoded by this gene called Homer. Um, and what that does is it kind of scales back some of these excitatory connections that have been made over the course of the day. So you know, as you're going through the day, the neurons are communicating, they're connecting with one another, and you don't need all of that. So the idea is that it's clearing out some of that, it's restoring homeostasis of the brain. We don't know exactly if that's explaining everything though, because there's a lot of other stuff going on during sleep that's not just related to cellular homeostasis. And if you want to get down to it, jellyfish sleep, and jellyfish don't have a brain. So there's something else going on here. Um, it could be related to energy conservation, right? So it could just be that we need rest. We need to restore the rest of our muscle groups, the rest of our bodies. Um, the issue there is that engaging in mindfulness, engaging in meditation, some of those like quiet rest sorts of activities, they might actually conserve a similar amount of energy to sleep. Because um, there are active stages of sleep too. It could be that it's memory consolidation. Um, so we do have a lot of information, a lot of research that suggests that if you learn new information just before going to sleep, then you can actually retain that information a little bit better. Um, so this applies a, a lot of times in research to learning a new language or learning nonsense words, that kind of stuff. If you do it immediately prior to bed, you'll remember those things better in the morning. So there's a lot of support for that one. But it, again, doesn't explain everything. These various other functions, you know, that have m like minimal to some level of support, um, you know, is physical growth, especially during adolescence. Um, we see that the pituitary gland does release more growth hormone over the course of the night for adolescents, so this could be important, at least for them. They have a lot of other issues with their sleep, though, that we'll talk about. Um, this last one, discharging emotions, you know, this is a little bit more maybe psycho psychoanalytic in nature, but, you know, if we're thinking about um, how we go through the day and we're following social norms and we're experiencing a lot of different sorts of complex emotional situations, then we can only get so much of that out during the day without being judged, without you know um, upsetting our boss, without things like that. Um, so potentially during dreams or over the course of the night, this could be a time that we're getting the rest of that out and kind of clearing out those emotional situations. Again, kind of hard to research this, um, but ultimately what we know is that we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know exactly why we're sleeping. It's probably a combination of all of these things. <coughs> Excuse me. We do know that at some point, your body will start to crave sleep. You will physically start to crave it, um, similar to the way you might crave chocolate or something like that. If you don't get any sleep, there is a point at which we kind of reach our limit and you can die. Um, so one example of this is this incredibly rare genetic disease that's called fatal familial insomnia. It's in a single bloodline from a family in Italy. Um, so if you have it, you already know you have it. Otherwise, you probably don't have it. Um, but what happens is that these individuals can only go into very light stages of sleep. They don't drop into any of the deeper stages of sleep or into REM sleep. And typically within seven to 36 months of being diagnosed, um, we end up seeing that these people pass away. So something is going on where you need some of those more restorative stages of sleep. There's also animal studies. Of course, we've you know, put rats, we've put mice through total sleep deprivation and seen how long they can last. Um, you know, depending on the animal, it could be as little as like two weeks or so. Um, but you know, with humans, there was this one example that is incredibly confounded, um, but you might find this on the internet, where a gentleman in China was watching um, the Euro tournament, which is a soccer tournament that occurs in Europe 
um, uh, every four years. And they wanted to watch all of the games. The time change made it so that he was working during the day and then watching the games at night. And he stayed up for 11 days straight, and he ended up passing away. Um, the issue <laughs> related to this is that he was also doing a lot of drugs to try to stay awake. Um, so it's not entirely clear that it was just the sleep deprivation or if there were some other causal factors there. Um, the thing that I like to say to my patients, probably to the point where they get annoyed by me, is that when sleep goes, everything goes. Because you start to see everything else kind of trickle and get worse. You start to see your mood get worse. Your cognition slows. It's harder to pay attention. It's harder to focus. You become more irritable. Um, it's harder for you to do basic functioning, like driving or getting to class or that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really a vital function that people don't pay too, too much attention to, unfortunately. So moving into the next topic, what is sleep physically? How do we measure it? So we'll do a little pretest here. Um, true or false, so you can raise your hand if you think it's true. Um, if you want a good night of restorative sleep, you need to spend most of that time in REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Raise your hand if you think that's true. OK. A few here and there, OK. And then number two, in order to stage sleep, it's best to have what information? So we want electro, um, electroencephalogram data, so EEG uh, data from electrical data from your brain, uh, respiratory data, heart rate data, or all of the above. You can hold up your little, I see a lot of Ds, some As, yeah, C. If any of you are students in my class, then you would know the answer to this, because I, uh, I make a joke with them about certain answers on multiple choice. All right, so we'll come back to this, though. We'll talk about these. So when we're talking about sleep, we talk about it in stages. Um, so we have stage one, stage two. We have stage three now is typically all we call it. It's sometimes called stage three or stage four. Um, they used to divide them into two different stages, but now we typically cluster them together because the differences are not that huge. For research purposes, it's probably important to split them apart, though. Those are all considered non-REM sleep. And then we have REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. This is like a really weird way that we categorize this. Like, there's not many other things that we say, oh, I'm eating or I'm not eating. Like, it, it, there's nothing that's particularly special about REM except for, well, that's not entirely true, but. There's, there's nothing like more important about REM than any of these other stages of sleep. Um, but for whatever reason, we like to categorize them separately. You need all of them is kind of the summary there. We get this data um, primarily using EEG data that's found through a polysomnography. Um, so polysomnography is an overnight sleep study. Um, here, typically, I think they do them mostly um, at one of the hotels nearby, sometimes in the sleep center as well. Um, but you're hooked up to a lot of different data, or a lot of different data sources. Um, so you'll have sensors on your head to measure your electrical activity, so that's our EEG data. You'll have respiratory monitors, you'll have heart rate monitors, um, you will have oxygen saturation, you'll have um, snoring monitors, you will have movement monitors, all sorts of things hooked up to you. And then the wires will go out into a computer that is analyzed by somebody who's called a registered polysomnography technician. Um, whose job it is is to watch you sleep um, and then read the data from it. And the data are complex, so these are people who know what they're doing. Stage one of sleep, this is the electroencephalogram data or EEG data, um, looks something like this. So there's a lot of activity going on in the brain. We start to see these things that are called theta waves. So as the waves kind of break up a little bit, their frequency gets a little bit less. Um, the amplitude's about the same, so the height of the waves is about the same but they just start to become a little less frequent. So that's how we can guess that you've fallen into stage one sleep. This is like very light sleep, drowsiness. It could literally feel like you were falling. Has anybody had that sensation before? Yeah. It feels weird, but that's, that's going into stage one, essentially. And this takes up typically about 10% of your sleep over the course of the night. Stage two sleep takes up about 60% of your sleep. So stage two sleep is actually incredibly important. Um, we spend the largest portion of our time here. And we can tell that we're in stage two because these two different things start to happen in our EEG data. We get these things called sleep spindles, which are these like rapid bursts of activity that happen electrically in the brain. And then we get these K-complexes, which are these pretty big amplitude waves um, that kind of look like the letter K. 
Um, sleep spindles are actually really heavily associated with memory consolidation, so people who have more of these during stage two might be remembering things better. Body temperature starts to drop, heart rate starts to slow during this stage. We get into more of like a light stage of sleep. Stage three, again, stage three and stage four, um, look something like this, so totally different. We have these delta waves is what they're called, so these really high amplitude, low frequency waves, um, and this takes up about 10% of sleep. We also call this stage slow wave sleep, because uh, you know, the waves are slow, um, so it's a really obvious name for it, um, or deep sleep sometimes too. So this is a harder stage to wake people out of. It might take a little bit more effort. REM sleep looks very, very different from other stages of sleep. It actually looks like you're awake in some senses. Um, so your brain is pretty active during REM sleep. Um, it takes up about 15 to 20% of your night of sleep. This is typically where dreaming is thought to occur the most. Um, again, your brain's really active in some areas. Um, so you might be like replaying memories. You might be you know, going through something that happened to you when you were in third grade and it just popped into your head while you were sleeping. Um, but you can dream in other stages too. It's just most commonly associated with REM. Um, and it's called REM because it's rapid eye movement sleep. So if you have a bed partner and you look at them and they're in REM sleep, they will probably be pretty quiet. They will have no muscle tones through the rest of their body, except for their eyes will be darting back and forth. And that's a little alarming to see, um, but it's totally normal. That's just what REM looks like. The muscle tone goes away because if you do have dreams during REM, or this is one of the reasons, um, you don't wanna be acting out your dreams, right? So you wanna be quiet, you want your body to be relaxed. Um, so we have this, this period of time where we might be engaging in more activi activity, at least neuronally, um, but we're not really engaging in any activity in the body. We also have a little bit more like heart rate variability that goes on here, a little respiratory variability. Um, you can have some little like kind of muscle twitches that happen during REM, but otherwise your body's pretty quiet. So this is what it looks like when you're hooked up. We do this with kids too. They're adorable, it's really hard to get all of the monitors on them. Um, you give them a lot of stickers, a lot of, a lot of chocolate, um, all that kind of stuff, just to really rev them up before bed. Um, but you can see, you know, next to both of the, this little guy and this gentleman, there's kind of like a, 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 a little uh, computer that everything goes into, and then that kind of runs to the computer that the RPSG uh, tech is looking at. And this is what they see. Um, so they're getting a huge stream of data. This person actually, those, um, they really only have a couple of EEG uh, sensors on, so those top two would be our EEG sensors. The next two are um, your ocular sensors, so again, to measure if you're in REM, we need to see if your eyes are moving. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's above the right eye and below the left eye where those sensors go. Then we have one on your chin to see if your chin is moving, if we're having any twitches. You have your EKG. Um, we have leg movements. If people are having um, like restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movement disorder, we wanna look for that. We have a monitor for snoring, for airflow, for thoracic um, and abdominal effort, and then for um, your oxygen saturation as well. So there's a few different things that I, again, I'm not an RPSG, so I would want somebody else to read this or you know, give me more information. Um, but there's a few things that kind of pop out. There's some eye movements that are going on. Um, there's some, uh, chin movements that are going on. So typically we're seeing some of those twitches. We have some heart rate variability. Um, and then we have the snore that happens too. So there's a little bit of activity in the snore uh, sensor. So either this person maybe woke up after that snoring or maybe they're in REM. Um, the biggest way to tell the difference between REM and actually being awake in terms of EEG data are these little things called sawtooth waves. And unless you're a professional that can read these, it's really hard to see them. Um, there's some indication that those might exist, but I don't wanna assume that there is. So either this person is in REM or they might be um, waking up at that point. With this data, and the other thing to point out is this is only like about 30 seconds of data. Um, so if you're sleeping for eight hours, you get a lot of data to read. Um, but what you can do after that is kind of consolidate it into this thing that we call a hypnogram. So a hypnogram is gonna show how you went through these stages of sleep over the course of the night. Um, and typically what we see is that the average person will cycle through from stage one to REM sleep in about 90 to 120 minutes. Um, again, this is 
an average perfect night of sleep. I've never seen anybody who has a hypnogram that looks like this. This is just not what actually happens. Um, the thing that we do often see, though, is that the time that we spend in REM might increase over the course of the night. Um, so, you know, your first REM cycle might be something like half an hour, but then the next, the next time you go through REM, it might be a few minutes longer. By the end of the night, it might be closer to like 45 minutes or so. There's a lot of other ways that you can measure sleep. PSGs are expensive. They also have to be clinically indicated. Um, you can't just like go and get one. And I also wouldn't recommend it because it's not gonna tell you anything unless you have a sleep disorder that you're really worried about. Um, a lot of times what people will do is they will use like wristwatches, they'll use apps and things like that. So I wanted to make sure we touched on those. Um, one of these watches is called actigraphy or acta watches. These are more typically used in like research or clinical labs. Um, they're similar to any other watch that you might wear. They just don't have any of the other bells and whistles. They're exclusively accelerometers. Um, so they're monitoring movement essentially in the body. Um, so if you're quiet, it's assumed that you're in a sleep state. If you're moving, then it's assumed that you're awake. Um, the accelerometers are a little more sensitive than the ones that you might have in your watch or your Fitbit or something like that. And they're really expensive. So these are costing like $1,000, $2,000. Um, and you don't really get anything else from them. So there's no benefit for any of you to go out and buy one unless you run a sleep lab. Um, but the other thing that it might have in some of the models is these like light sensors. So it can again kind of tell if um, you know it's daytime versus nighttime or if you have a lot of lights on. But you'll get a readout that looks something like that. So having these like black bars would indicate if somebody was awake or having an awakening um, versus when there's fewer of those, when they're spread out, um, that's a person who's sleeping. And you'll see, you know, even on a person who had like a decent night of sleep, this was a five-year-old sleep um, from a study on like typical sleep patterns for kiddos. Um, there's gonna be a number of awakenings through the night and that's totally normal. Um, you know, so you can have up to like 15 to 20 awakenings over the course of the night and have that be a reasonable amount. You're just typically amnestic. You don't remember any of those happening. Um, this kid will probably remember those last two. There's a number, like a, an amount of activity that's going on that would suggest that maybe they woke up and got out of bed or um, they had a drink of water or they were moving around enough that that kid will probably remembers those awakenings. There's also sleep gadgets. There's a lot of them. Uh, I'm sure you've seen ads for them. Um, I'm sure you've seen different kinds of uh, you know, apps on phones for them. Um, some of them just require your cell phone. Others require that you have some kind of fitness tracker and then it links to an app. Um, typically, if you have one of these fitness trackers, then it's monitoring your movement, again, with an accelerometer. Um, some of them have heart rate monitors in them. And then sometimes they're doing audio recordings too. So if you're worried about snoring, that kind of stuff, um, then you can record your sleep um, in that manner as well. The accuracy for them is super debatable. Um, so it, the, depending on what models you have, depending on how you're using them, what features you're using of them, they can be off by as much as two hours when you compare them to something like a polysomnography. Um, and there's a lot of data that's, that's comparing these different kinds of gadgets. Um, this one specifically was comparing a PSG to a Fitbit Ultra, um, which I don't know that these are really around anymore. This is a couple years old at this point. Um, but the Fitbit Ultra and then the Fitbit Ultra when it's on sensitive mode. So you can see, so the PSG is our, our gold standard. We get so much information from this that this seems to be our best way of measuring sleep. When we compare it to that Fitbit Ultra, we're seeing that the Fitbit Ultra is overestimating the amount of minutes that we're spending sleeping. It's also underestimating the amount of time that we're awake after we sleep. So TST is total sleep time. WASO is wake after sleep onset. So if you've fallen asleep and then you wake up over the course of the night, you would say that that's a period of WASO. And then sleep efficiency is a mathematical calculation. It's your time that you spend asleep, so your total sleep time, divided by the amount of time that you're actually in bed because those are different things. Um, you don't immediately fall asleep the moment you get into bed. It's normal to take a few minutes. Um, so we're aiming to have as close to 100 as we can, but that's not typical for most people. If you can have 85 or above, that's pretty good. Um, so again, using the PSG, we're seeing that it's about 83%, but the Fitbit Ultra is saying it's closer to 90, 92%. The really concerning thing here is the sensitive um, portion, the sensitive setting 
Um, that Fitbit kind of markets as like, hey, if you're worried about a sleep disorder, set this to sensitive and see what happens. You know, monitor your sleep that way. This is vastly underestimating the amount of time that people are spending sleeping. Upwards of, you know, 105 minutes, so closer to two hours that it's underestimating your sleep time. It's really overestimating the amount of time that you're spending awake after you actually fall asleep. And then as a result, your sleep efficiency is way, way lower um, than what it was when you had a PSG. So this might lead people to think that I have a lot of trouble sleeping, I'm like really struggling with sleep, when that might not actually be the case. And then you're seeking care that you don't necessarily need. Okay, regroup, true or false? If you want a good night of restorative sleep, you need to spend most of it in REM. False. False. Yeah, you gotta get all of them. They're all important. Um, and actually, you're probably gonna spend most of your time in stage two sleep instead. And then in order to stage sleep, it is best to have what information? All of the above. If you're gonna try to stage it and figure out, was I in stage one, was I in stage two, you need to have all of that information. Again, that might not be that important for you to know. You might just be trying to figure out how good is my sleep quality. Um, you know, in that case, you definitely don't need a PSG. This is very specific to figuring out what stages are you going through, how is your breathing overnight, how is your movement overnight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so moving to the biological basis of sleep. Um, again, let's do a little pretest. Um, so true or false, our bodies run on basically a 24-hour schedule or rhythm, give or take like 20 to 30 minutes. Lots of trues. Um, the area of the brain that is our clock setter is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the retina, the thalamus, or the timex. <laughs> I'm gonna hold up, I know, it's, it's so tempting. <laughs> C, A, so I'm seeing a good mix of C's and A's. Okay, we'll come back to these. Um, so your brain is synchronized to a, or your sleep is synchronized to a solar clock. Um, so we follow the sun. Um, so it runs on about a 24-hour cycle or a 24-hour phase. We call this entrainment. Um, so we use that solar clock to decide whether it's day or night, and then we run on that. And you know, circadian, so our circadian rhythm comes from Latin, so circa about, diem a day. Um, so again, that's where we kind of get this, like, this name and then the 24-hour focus. We talk about these three different components when we're talking about the biological basis of sleep. So we have these chemical components or these central components um, that are really driving drowsiness versus wakefulness. We have these input pathways that are these environmental or exogenous cues that are telling us you know, whether we should be awake or whether we should be sleeping. And then we have these output pathways. So our um, clock setter, our brain, talks to all of these different areas of the body um, and kind of sets our signals to change our behavior, to change different physiological functioning, um, you know, to change heart rate, to change all sorts of different things. The question is, is it entirely exogenous? Or so is this entirely run from outside of our body? Or is there some kind of thing internally that's deciding these things, that's kind of setting this clock? And there is. It's in our interior hypothalamus. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So all you who said A, that's our word of the day. <laughs> it's really fun to say. Um, so there is this endogenous clock. So it lives within our hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is really important for a lot of different functioning behaviors from day to day. Um, you know, it's associated with the four Fs, so fighting, fleeing, feeding, and fornicating. Um, it's involved in temperature regulation. It's involved in sleep and wake. It's involved in all sorts of like growth, all sorts of things, hunger, satiety. Um, all these kind of basic functions go through the hypothalamus. So that's where our sleep clock is located as well. Um, other thing that's important kind of from like a structural standpoint is that your suprachiasmatic nucleus is located right above your optic chiasm. So this is how we get entrained to light. This is why the light piece is so important. So your retina receives light information from the sun. Even on a not so sunny day, it receives light information. Your retinal hypothalamic tract sends that back under through the eye um, and underneath the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then that kind of sets your clock. It decides, is it daytime, is it nighttime? And it tells your pineal gland whether it should be releasing melatonin or not. And we'll talk about melatonin much, much more. Um, but when there's light out, we typically see melatonin is suppressed. We don't have as much of that being released. Once it gets darker, then we see that melatonin is increased in the brain. <coughs> 
if for some reason this area of the brain is destroyed, is lesioned, is in, in, you know, not functioning correctly, we'll see that the amount of sleep and wake time does not change. So we still will sleep about the same amount of time, we'll still be awake about the same amount of time. The 24 hour clock that it runs on does. So this is a case um, you know, where they had some rats, some of them had their suprachiasmatic nucleus removed, so those would be the ones that have no diurnal rhythm, and then some had their normal kind of structures. Um, so all of those like black bars are times when the rat is running on a wheel and being really active. And you know, rats are nocturnal, so they're running more at night, they're engaging more behavior at night when their SDN is working fu and functioning normally. When they don't have it, then it just looks like they're free reign, they're doing whatever they want, whenever they want. However, if you kind of push those times together, then it would be about the same as those, those rats that did have a normally functioning SDN. It's just the way that it runs is a little different. There's a lot more evidence for the hypothalamus just broadly in how it functions with sleep. Um, so one area, the ventral lateral preoptic area, um, so this is kind of in the middle there, the VLPO in blue. Um, that area is associated with GABA release. GABA is our inhibitory neurotransmitter, kind of calms the body, slows the body down. Um, and it talks to other areas of the brain that are typically more activating. Um, so the TMN, for instance, that releases histamine. Um, so histamine is a pretty wake-inducing substance. Um, so the VLPO kind of says, hey, let's calm down this process, let's not release as much histamine, let's calm the body. If that area isn't functioning very well, then we tend to see people experience insomnia. So they're not able to fall asleep as regularly or as readily. Um, you know, they might be waking up multiple times overnight, that kind of stuff. The lateral hypothalamus, um, so it's not actually labeled on here, but in the red where it says hypocretin, um, that is an area that releases hypocretin or orexin is sometimes called. Um, and this is a really wake promoting area of the brain um, or substance in the brain. And so this talks to other areas of the brain that would typically maybe be a little bit more inhibitory. Um, and if it's working well, then it keeps you awake. If it's not working so well, then you might be experiencing things like narcolepsy. So you might fall into sleep stages a little more readily than you're supposed to or when you're not willing to actually be falling into those stages. There's other areas of the brain that are important too. Um, these areas communicate broadly with other areas of the brain. Um, so you know, our brain stem contains what, we ha or contains what we call our reticular activating system. And it sends these really nonspecific kind of signals to the rest of the brain that, hey, time to wake up, time to be active, time to be engaged. If it passes through our SDN when it's nighttime and when we're supposed to be sleeping, then the SDN will say, nope, not gonna send these signals, not gonna communicate this. Similarly, the thalamus will do the same thing. It'll kind of slow those things down. Um, alternatively, if it is time to wake up, then it'll send those signals to the rest of the brain and say, we need to be activated, we need to be engaged. Um, the thalamus has also been associated with kind of synchronizing EEG behavior across different areas of the brain and with sleep spindles as well. So that area or that, that period of time in uh, stage two where you start to um, experience those rapid bursts of electrical activity. So our brain plays a really important role, of course, in sleep-wake, but there's a lot of these external cues for sleep as well. Um, we call these zeitgeibers, that's another fun word of the day. Um, you know, where this is regulated by your feeding schedule, you know, a lot of times the typical kind of feeding behavior would be three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, that's not what everybody does, but that's kind of the typical things that kind of set those clocks. Again, light is really important in this scenario. Um, you know, people who are experiencing total blindness, they don't have a similar rhythm. Um, they have a different kind of circadian rhythm. They have non-24 is what it's called. You've probably seen medications for that um, on TV. So, you know, this is a really big one um, that we experience and that tells us what time it is. Similarly, activity too. So, um, you know, the amount of activity that you're engaging in, when you're engaging in activities, if you're following like a work schedule or a school schedule or something like that, those things help to indicate what time it is and whether we should be awake or asleep. What happens if we take those away? So what happens if we just put you in a dark room and <laughs> see what happens, you know? Um, so they've done this with plants, because um, plants also have a circadian rhythm. Um, we see that if you keep plants in darkness, that they're still gonna kind of follow the light. So the leaves will kind of move to where the sun would be, even if they don't actually see it. 
We also see similar kinds of things for nocturnal rodents. If they're kept in continuous darkness, they'll still kind of follow the same sort of patterns. With people, um, so this study was looking at if you gave people the opportunity to kind of get a typical sleep schedule over those first 10 days, and then we took away all the zeitgebers, so we kept you in total darkness. We took away all clocks. We took away anything that would give you an indication for what time it was. Um, we see that the sleep and like wake period kind of extends a little bit. So we still see a similar pattern of you're gonna sleep for a consolidated period of time and then you're gonna be awake and active, but we see it actually looks a little bit more like 25 hours or so. Um, so everything just kind of shifts an hour every single day. And this is what we call like free running. So if given the opportunity to have nothing to tell us what time it is, this is what it'll kind of start to look like. And then if we go back to having those zeitgebers, you see you pretty quickly entrain to that 24 hour period again. You get back to the same kind of, um, same kind of schedule. So this is regulated by some of these competing processes. Um, so sleep is regulated by our circadian rhythm and then by sleep homeostasis. So we call these process C and process S. Process C is the thing that's sending these alerting signals over the course of the day. So from the moment you wake up, you start to see those increase over the course of the day. There is this period of time in the afternoon where they do actually dip. Um, and so that's why you feel kind of sleepy after lunch. Your alerting signals have gone down during that time. And then process S, alternatively, is also building over the course of the day from the moment that you wake up. Um, but these are kind of more of our drowsiness signals that are building. And these can be slowed by things. Um, so like adenosine is one of those, um, one of these, these substances that makes us feel drowsy. Adenosine is blocked by caffeine, so it can't do its job anymore if you're drinking enough caffeine. Um, so you have ways to kind of slow this process down if you need to. The other piece um, is you do have an override switch called process W. So that's like if suddenly the fire alarm goes off, then you're gonna wake up. Um, you do have this response to danger that will get you out of your sleep stage, which is again, evolutionarily really, really important. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so you have these sleep drives, the sleep homeostasis drive that's building up over the course of the day, and it's kind of working against this circadian rhythm or this alertness signal that's building. You see around 2 p.m. or so, that's where we see that alertness signal drops a little bit and you might feel kind of drowsy. Um, but then we see it build up again. If we wanna kind of match this as best as we can, and this is really individual, so this is the person who's pretty well entrained to sleeping from 10.30 to 6.30, um, matching your bedtime to about an hour and a half or so after your alertness signal starts to go down is the best thing that you can do. Um, so in this case, this person's alertness signal is going down around 9 p.m. and they're sleeping around 10.30. This is really hard to figure out. It takes a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of effort to figure out where you fall in this rhythm and in this pattern. Um, but if you are able to figure out those processes, then you can match your sleep to these processes pretty well. Okay, so true or false, now that we know. Um, our bodies run on a basically 24 hour cycle, you know, again, give or take 20 or 30 minutes. True. true. The area of the brain that's our clock setter is the? Yeah, good on you. Fun to say. <laughs> All right, so how much sleep do you actually need? Um, this is kind of like, it's, it's talked about a lot. Um, so true or false, first of all, so our, our pretest, older adults require less sleep than young adults or middle-aged adults. Okay. I'm actually shocked that there was so much like gumption about that one. Good on you. All right, and then adolescent sleep is characterized by A, advancement of sleep phase, so going to bed earlier, B, delay of sleep phase, so going to bed later, decreased time of sleep and increased sleepiness, or both B and C. And Taha, you know, you throw up your little, your little card. C, D, B. All right, I see some good variety, I like that, okay. We'll talk about that. Adolescents, I'm sorry, but adolescents are a little bit doomed, so just be aware. Um, so this is what the National Sleep Foundation, so one of kind of our governing bodies that puts out sleep recommendations, um, this is what they recommend for different age groups. Um, so you see newborns, of course, are sleeping a lot. It doesn't feel that way, but they actually do sleep a lot. Um, by the time you're getting to infancy and toddlerhood, we're seeing those sleep needs decrease some. 
And by the time you're out of the preschool age, we're seeing that naps kind of go away and sleep really consolidates more. Um, and then basically from like late teen years, young adulthood on, the average need is about eight hours. Um, so there is actually this common belief that by the time you're in like the later stages of life, if you're 65 or older or something, then you might not need as much sleep. Um, but that's really not the case. We do see that sleep needs are about the same once you get to older adulthood. What are the actual people doing with their sleep? Um, so right, like these are recommendations. What are people actually sleeping? We kind of have this bell curve, this normal curve that most people are following. Um, so you know, again, yeah, on average, people are sleeping somewhere in that like six and a half to like eight and a half hour range in adulthood. Um, but we do have people who are short sleepers, so people who are sleeping less than six hours. We have people who are long sleepers or sleeping more than nine hours. Um, the number of those people is much smaller, but we do know that there is actually potentially some like genetic component to that. There was a study that just came out that pointed to um, one particular gene that a family had passed down um, in, their, in their generations, and everybody in their family just could not sleep more than six hours, and it was potentially due to this gene. Um, they're trying to find other candidate genes that could be related to this, but they found a couple so far um, that might make people more prone to be these short sleepers. Let's go through these age groups really quickly. Um, so infants and toddlers, they have really high sleep needs, right? Like they get cranky, they need to be sleeping. Um, it does become more consolidated after the newborn stage, and then it continues to consolidate through early childhood. Circadian rhythm typically arises around two to three months in kiddos. Um, you know, that's why you might see, um, if you're interested in doing sleep training with infants, um, that's typically the time that you can start doing that kind of stuff. Uh, their cycles are a little shorter, so they're not like ours that are like 90 to 120 minutes. Um, theirs are closer to 50 minutes until about nine months old. And then we also see that they split REM and non-REM a little bit more evenly. Um, but this is kind of just graphically representing the different periods of sleep time versus wakefulness across these early age groups and then compared to adults. Um, so we see newborns, they're sporadic, right? They're gonna sleep for one hour chunks, two hour chunks here and there. It's really hard to predict because um, they don't have any sort of like cycle or rhythm that they're following yet. By the time they're one, we're seeing you maybe getting a couple of naps during the day and then more consolidated sleep overnight. By the time they're three, we're seeing it's really just the one nap that we're shooting for and then more consolidated sleep again overnight. By the time they're nine, we should definitely not see kids napping regularly anymore. Um, naps should typically go, they, they're typically gone by the time kids are six. Um, ideally, they're going away by like four or five um, and we're really consolidating sleep overnight. Adolescents, poor adolescents, um, they have so much going on. Uh, so in, in addition to puberty, they also have this developmental phenomenon that's going on where melatonin is actually released later for them. So for us, you know, we might have melatonin that's released around like eight o'clock, something like that. Uh, adolescents are not gonna have their melatonin be released in some cases until like 10 or 11. And the melatonin is what we call like a chronobiotic. So it's one of the things that sets our clock and tells uh, like the rest of our body whether we should be sleeping or not. Um, so if we don't have that, then we don't necessarily start the cascade of cues that are telling us if we need to go to bed. Uh, interestingly, the over-the-counter kind of clock setting dose that's recommended for this group for melatonin is like 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams. If you've ever looked at melatonin at the store, you probably see it's like a three milligram dose or maybe sometimes one milligram to three milligrams. Um, so it's really a lot lower than what people might think. Um, but this process makes it really, really hard for kids to get to bed on time, adolescents to get to bed on time, and then to wake up when they need to wake up. And you know, we have this kind of backwards issue um, where we were sending middle schoolers to, to school later than our high schoolers which is not what it should be. It should be the high schoolers are going to school later because they need that extra time to sleep. Um, and there have been some school systems that have really tested this. Um, and we see that there's some pretty huge benefits to letting your adolescents sleep in a little bit more. I do wanna talk about melatonin briefly for a second because um, melatonin always comes up. <laughs> so again, melatonin is a chronobiotic. So it's a thing that defines whether it is night or day um, and what activities our body should be doing as a result of that. So it's kind of that thing that's telling you, are you a morning lark? Are you a night owl? You know, do you benefit from doing things in the morning versus that night? 
and it's really significantly tied to our circadian rhythm. If the levels of melatonin are low or not being released at the right time, then we're gonna see changes in the timing of sleep. Um, and so this is where this delayed sleep phase syndrome comes into play for adolescents. Um, and you'll see in older adults, we can sometimes have advanced sleep phase syndrome because of melatonin as well. And so this is kind of the typical pattern. Again, you know, around eight o'clock, seeing that melatonin levels are start to, starting to rise, and then overnight they kind of peak, and then they drop by the time we're awake. But the important thing to kind of stress here is that melatonin is not necessarily a thing that makes you drowsy. It's not a sedative, it's not a hypnotic. Um, it's not the thing that's going to put you to sleep. So this is kind of the thing that adolescents are dealing with, this whole like cascade of stuff that is just ruining their morning. Um, so they have this circadian phase delay, they have this slow rise of sleep pressure in part due to melatonin, and then that delays your sleep time. We also are trying to make independent adults out of our adolescents, so we're trying to give them a little more autonomy, trying to let them figure things out on their own. They have a lot of academic pressure, they have significant amounts of social pressure, um, you know, through social media and networking. And then this all combines with having this really early rise time that they have to get up for school. So this leads to kids that are early or late to bed and early to rise and it ultimately end up being short sleepers. And then you have this irritable adolescent that you have to like physically shake or like pour ice water on or something to get up out of bed. And this is the reason for it. They're experiencing later sleep needs than what you, know, you or I or young children might need. There's a lot of really significant consequences to this. Um, you know, adolescents are learning how to drive, and that's really scary um, in and of itself. So, you know, we're seeing that these kiddos, they tend to have longer response times. They're not as quick to hit the brakes. They're not as quick to respond to things. Um, and so we're seeing more motor vehicle accidents as a result in this age group. There's also just poor impulse control. These kids become more irritable. Their academic and learning performances are decreased. Um, they have a lot more stress and anger. Um, so these things all combine to kind of make this unfortunate situation where parents and adolescents have a really hard time during this age group. The young adults and college students, they're kind of getting out of that phase. They're developing these melatonin levels that are a little bit more reasonable and a little bit more uh, reasonably timed. Um, but they are experiencing a lot of other things. They're experiencing a lot more independence. They can define their schedules, um, the college students especially, specifically. Um, they're in dorm rooms potentially, so or some other kind of shared living environment when they've never been in one before. So they don't have the ability to necessarily control all of those things that could be important for sleep. They're experiencing a lot of social stressors, experiencing a lot of academic stressors, and again, don't necessarily have parents to kind of help guide them through that. There's some similar concerns we see for young adults who go directly into the work life or who go directly into the military. Um, but we see those schedules be a little bit more defined by you know, whatever body they're working for. Um, so there's not as many necessarily that pop up for that age or for those, that population. This is some data from our students. Um, so these are a combination of uh, 1,200 students within UVM, their first years and sophomores. Um, and uh, some of them are in the wellness environment, some are in the general student population. I think it's split pretty evenly. Um, and what they did was they tracked their sleep for a good chunk of time. Um, I think they have something like 165,000 data points on these kids. Um, and what they did was it kind of mapped out how sleep looked across the school year, essentially. And we can see on the side, so that's the prevalence or the percentage of students that are getting at least eight hours of sleep. And then how that kind of maps out over the school year. So you see that those kids, once they get home for breaks, once they're at home for Thanksgiving, winter break, spring break, you see these big spikes in the amount of time that they're sleeping. Um, you know, when they're at school, we see that kind of drop a little bit. Fewer students are able to get that necessary, or potentially necessary eight hours of sleep. If we break it down a little differently and look at their week, you see on Monday, they start out okay, and then it kind of goes down very subtly, the percentage of kids that are able to get that amount of sleep, that eight hours or more. And then on the weekends, they really try to overcompensate. Um, they're trying to sleep more during that time. And we'll talk about why that's problematic. Adults. Um, so again, as adults age, sleep needs don't really change all that much. We do see a lot of changes in sleep timing and in sleep architecture. So sleep architecture is how we're going through those different stages of sleep. Um, so this kind of maps out from birth until you know, later in life how are we kind of hitting those different stages and how much time are we spending in those stages of sleep. 
So you see by the time you're 65 and older, slow wave sleep is really starting to decline, so that middle one, um, the SWS there. Um, we see some changes um, in the amount of time that you're spending awake after you've fallen asleep, um, so that WASO time. Again, by the time you're in older adulthood, that time is expanding, so you might be waking up more during the course of the night. There's a lot of you know, things that go on in adulthood that really affect sleep that unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to get into, but if you have questions, I'm happy at the end. Shift work is a really big one. Um, so if you are working late at night or if you're working an overnight shift or something like that, and you know, those schedules can vary too, so some days you're during the day and some days you're at night, that can be really detrimental for your sleep and for your circadian rhythm. Pregnancy and postpartum, there's a lot of changes that happen with sleep. Um, and a lot of changes that happen in response to having a new human in your home. Um, but again, if you have more questions, we can talk about that later. Um, and then jet lag. I mean, jet lag occurs across age groups. Um, but again, depending on your job, depending on what kind of things you're required to do to see family, to see friends, to travel, whatever, jet lag might be impacting, you know, adults a little bit more. If we look at these like hypnograms and see how sleep is kind of spread out again, um, so those black bars would be REM sleep and then kind of dropping into these later stages of sleep at the bottom. You know, one thing you notice is that REM sleep is like, it's usually like higher on these graphs and that's primarily because we think of it as being more active sleep again, so it looks more like wakefulness, that's why it's kind of higher. Um, you'll see that like it looks a little different. So by the time that you get to young adulthood, there's a couple more awakenings typically, but it's not that much. By the time you're into the 65 plus range, then we're getting a lot more awakenings over the course of the night. And you see that REM is kind of spread out a little bit differently. It's not necessarily that you're getting more REM over the course of the night um, like you would be getting in adulthood. Yeah, we will talk about that when we talk about sleep hygiene. Um, but yes, is the short answer. You do want to be like that. You do want to have consistency. Um, you know, again, to kind of compare to adolescents too, we're seeing the opposite that happens in older adulthood. We see that we have an advancement in our sleep stages. Um, you know, melatonin production kind of declines as, as you age. Um, and so we just might not be getting the same kind of cues or we might be getting those cues at different times when we reach older adulthood. That makes us more likely to fall asleep earlier and then wake up earlier as well. If we relate some of these um, sleep variables to things like survival, to morbidity and mortality, um, we do see that uh, there's a number of different things that pop up as being important. Um, so we see that if you are a short sleeper, um, if you're taking too long to fall asleep, so that top one is your sleep latency, yeah, that's the amount of time that it takes from when you hit the pillow to when you actually fall asleep. If it's more than 30 minutes, then we're seeing that your likelihood of survival actually dips a lot faster than if you're somebody who can get to sleep a little bit faster. We're also seeing that REM, if you're spending too much time or too little time, then your survival likelihood is lower or it's dropping faster um, than those individuals who are getting a more reasonable amount of REM. And I'm having trouble seeing this one, sleep efficiency too. Um, so if you are somebody who has lower sleep efficiency, again, maybe spending more time in bed but not actually sleeping, um, then we see that the survival analysis kind of dips a little bit faster than people who have higher sleep efficiency. That's not meant to be depressing, it's just things to think about. <laughs> um, so again, true or false, you guys already knew this one, so I didn't even need to test you on it. Older adults require less sleep than young adults or middle-aged adults. False, false. yep. Basically it's eight hours at that point. And adolescent sleep is characterized by which of these? D, yeah, it's both B and C. So they have this delay in their sleep phase, which is related to melatonin. And then they have this decreased sleep time overall and this increased sleepiness as a result. So now what can I do? How do I help this? <laughs> this is what everybody wants to know. How do I make this better? Um, so true or false, if you have pretty significant sleep issues like insomnia or something, then cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the treatment of choice for a number of those kinds of sleep disorders, like insomnia, um, you know, like uh, even restless leg syndrome, this can be helpful for that kind of stuff. I kind of gave it away there. Um, <laughs> and then two, a characteristic of good sleep hygiene may be, A, drinking a large amount of water to stay hydrated before bed, 
drinking <laughs> three to four glasses of wine to help fall asleep, <laughs> going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, which is fitting to your question, sir, um, or sleeping in a very warm room. <laughs> See, maybe. Um, we'll talk about it. Um, so sleep hygiene, just kind of broadly, I always ask my students this, and I always get that one person that's like, washing your sheets or like brushing your teeth, um, which is not wrong. Like, that's fine. You can count that as sleep hygiene if you want. That's probably a good bedtime routine. Um, so this is the set of behavioral or environmental recommendations that are meant to promote healthy sleep, to make it as best as we possibly can. We derived a lot of these from people with insomnia specifically, and then we said, geez, this should be helpful for everybody. Like, this can't hurt. Why don't we try this for the general population? Um, so we'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail, but these are kind of the big things that we think about when we're thinking about sleep hygiene. So your caffeine and nicotine, other stimulant use, um, alcohol use or other depressants, your exercise and when you're getting it, um, the meals that you're eating, the liquids that you're drinking, your stress level, um, the bedroom environment itself, so, you know, what does your bedroom look like? Is there clutter? How's the temperature? All that kind of stuff. Naps. I get on my students about naps a lot. Um, and then timing of sleep. So caffeine does lower our sleep drive. We talked about this a little bit. So adenosine is typically something that's making us feel drowsy over the course of the day. So caffeine is going to block the process of adenosine. It actually blocks the receptors that it would bind to. Um, so in that case, it's going to make it so adenosine can't do its job appropriately. Um, so if you are drinking caffeine, so whether that's coffee, sodas, um, even, you know, if you're really worried about your sleep, even thinking about chocolate before bed, that kind of stuff, you do have to consider the half-life. So like a half, um, or the half-life of like an afternoon cup of coffee, potentially, that's like about five hours. Um, so you want to time it so that you're, you're not experiencing that caffeine um, experience that late at night when it's close to bedtime. If you're pregnant, then you can't do any caffeine between like nine hours before bed. So I struggle in the afternoon. Um, I'm doing good right now, though. Um, nicotine is a stimulant, of course, so it's going to alter your sleep drive. It's going to stimulate the body, make it hard to go to bed. Alcohol is a depressant. It's going to make you sleepy. It could put you to sleep, potentially. Um, but it's going to really throw off your sleep architecture. You're probably going to be waking up a lot more times over the course of the night if you're drinking a lot. Um, it's going to lead to, um, I think, lower uh, amounts of time that you're spending in slow wave sleep, so good deep restorative sleep. Um, so it's going to change how you go through those sleep cycles, and it's going to make it so you don't feel as rested in the morning. You don't feel like your sleep was very high quality as a result. Exercise is really helpful for sleep. So we want to kind of get rid of some of those activating signals. We're going to want to wear our bodies down a little bit. Um, so typically, we think about doing that earlier in the day. We don't want to do really high, vigorous exercise right before bed because, again, that might like stimulate you a little bit too much and get those endorphins going. There is some evidence, though, that doing light exercise before bed, whether it's like yoga or even going on like a brisk walk or something like that, could actually improve sleep onset. This might be related to, um, you know, similarly having like a hot shower or a hot bath before bed can be really helpful. You kind of want to separate as much that really high temperature to the temperature drop that occurs when you're about to go to sleep. Um, so this could be helpful in kind of mimicking that or making it more extreme or more obvious for the body um, if you're engaging in some kind of exercise. Meals and liquids, again, you want to avoid an excess before bed. You don't want to drink a ton of water. You could sip some water. Um, you don't want to dehydrate yourself while you're sleeping, um, but you don't want to have too much because then you're going to be getting up and using the restroom overnight and um, uh, interrupting your sleep. Having some kind of like light, carb-heavy sort of meal before bed could benefit sleep. It's going to diminish any chance of there being any overnight hunger. You're feeling like you need to go get a snack or something like that. Um, so, you know, like toast and peanut butter or something could be really helpful. As long as it's something light, um, you don't want to eat too much because then that gets digestion going and those processes are going to slow down to some extent during sleep. And then again, you want to avoid the frequent bathroom trips. Stress, don't bring your problems to bed. <laughs> the bedroom is not a place for problems. It's a really bad thing to be awake when your reasoning is sleeping. Um, because there gets to be a point where, like, cognitively, you're just not working through these things as well. You're tired. Your brain is tired. Um, and so you need to give it that rest and kind of give it that chance to recover again. Um, we talk about this a lot when we're talking about CBTI and we're talking about stimulus control. You want to give your brain the best chance at thinking that it's going to be sleeping. Um, so, you know, with adults, I say the, the best thing that you can do is use your bed exclusively for sleep and sex. 
then there's a 50-50 shot, right? Students love when I say that. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> um, but if you're adding all these other things, like you see you're working in bed, you're eating in bed, um, you're watching TV in bed, you're doing all these other things in bed, then you might start to think, like, when I get into bed, what am I actually doing? Like, what is my purpose in this space? You want to give yourself the best chance that that is possible. So removing all those other things and just making it your place for sleep and sex is the best way to do that. The bedroom environment, you know, you want to keep it cool. Um, typically, the temperature recommendations range from like 60 to 68 degrees for the bedroom. Um, you know, we're getting in the time right now, we're having the windows open overnight can be really nice. But then it can also be like 30 degrees in the morning, so it's a little tricky to balance. Um, you want to keep it quiet. You want to keep it dark. Um, again, having like light that's coming in, your, the eyelids on your eyes are not entirely opaque, so you're going to read some of that even if you are sleeping, and it could kind of heighten those cues that it's time to get up before it really is time to get up. Um, so having things like blackout curtains, that kind of stuff. There's some places in Europe that use, I can't think of the name of the word, but they literally use like steel sheets that they pull down um, that they'll keep, so they keep light out, um, and they work really well. But again, this is where like college can get kind of tricky. You're not in control of a lot of these things. So you're not in control of how quiet it is. You're not in control of how dark it is necessarily, depending on your roommate. Um, so some of those things become a little bit more tricky. Naps, you want to try to avoid them if you can. Um, you know, it's really hard, I know. I love napping too. Um, I tell pregnant women, you nap as much as you want. <laughs> like, that's fine. Um, really, it's be primarily because you want to build up that sleep drive. So the moment that you nap, then you're dropping some of that sleep drive. You're getting rid of it. And then by the end of the day, you're not going to feel as strongly that you need to sleep at that point. Power naps, caffeine naps, sometimes those can be really helpful for people. Um, it just, it, you know, it, use them sparingly. Um, my husband was kind enough to send me an article today that was like, hey, napping's actually good. Um, so, you know, I, I get this a lot, too, in terms of, um, you know, there's mixed research out there. There's mixed support for it. Um, it could, in this case, be beneficial for cardiac health, um, but it's, again, limiting those naps and making them, you know, more, no more than once a week or something like that. Timing of sleep, consistency is really key. Um, so that clock in the brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, does not care what day of the week it is. It doesn't care if it's a holiday. It doesn't care about any of that. It wants you to be consistent and following that rhythm the same time all the time. The concern that comes about is that you, if you are depriving yourself from sleep, if you're not sleeping enough and you're trying to play with that clock a little bit, then you can start to accrue sleep debt. And sleep debt is a little bit different from credit card debt. Paying it back is really difficult to do. Um, the best way to do it is to just get back on a consistent schedule. Um, I'll show you an example. So if you're an eight-hour sleeper, typically, you're sleeping from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., you go to bed late on Friday night. You got a party to go to. You're spending time with friends. You lose track of time. You go to bed at 1 a.m., but you know that, oh, gosh, I got to get up at 7 for some commitment. So you wake up at your usual time. So you only slept six hours. Similarly, on Saturday night, you stay up late again because it's the weekend. Um, you choose to sleep in on Sunday to make up for that lost sleep time, thinking that, like, hey, I can get it back. I'll get back on track. I'll average out to eight hours by getting 10 hours tonight. That means you woke up at 11 a.m. So do you think that by Sunday night at 11 p.m. you're going to be ready to sleep? No. So you've lost four hours to build up that sleep drive. That's a huge chunk of time. So it's going to take a little bit more to get you back into that rhythm. Um, you know, the best thing that we can suggest is let yourself be tired. Get over it. You know, feel tired for that one day and just get back into that same kind of schedule as soon as you can, and then your body will thank you for it later, rather than trying to play this back and forth of paying back sleep debt or not. So if you do actually need treatment for sleep disorders, for things like insomnia, things like um, circadian rhythm disorders, um, you know, we can talk about a couple of different kinds of treatments. Obstructive sleep apnea, too, that's a big one. Um, when we're talking about insomnia specifically, um, and again, CBTI for insomnia, or CBTI can be used for other sleep disorders too, but the most research is in insomnia. This is kind of the framework that we're following. So we assume that you have some kind of predisposing, you know, genetic variables. Even sleep hygiene actually gets categorized in these predisposing variables. So like how you relate to your sleep, your basic sleep routine. Um, those just kind of put you at some kind of risk at baseline. Then maybe we have these acute events, so some kind of stressor comes up. It lowers your sleep. Um, you know, you have an exam coming up, or you have some family emergency that came up. 
um, and it put you at a point where you just weren't able to sleep very much. Early kind of insomnia um, might be where those precipitating factors, so those acute stressors have gone away a little bit, like they're not as present anymore, but we've kind of developed these perpetuating unhealthy habits, that yellow, that put us over the edge and make it so that we're not getting very good sleep. Then by the time it gets to chronic insomnia, we're seeing that those precipitating factors, those acute stressors are a lot smaller, um, but we still have these unhealthy habits that we've built up. So we need to kind of address those. That's primarily what CBTI addresses. Um, so we do do a lot of sleep hygiene and education. We do sleep restriction, which is a terrible name for what it is. We just figure out how much you're sleeping on average and then you're only allowed to be in bed that amount of time. Um, so it's not that we're making you sleep less, it's that we're just kind of finding your average and then we're gonna build it up from there. We use stimulus control. You can only be in your bed when you're sleeping. You can only be in your bed when you're tired. Um, and then we use cognitive therapy too to kind of like work on the relaxation skills as needed, that kind of stuff. And any thoughts that might be throwing off your sleep. Anxiety plays a huge role in sleep, so um, we kind of have to address that. For obstructive sleep, ap sleep apnea, um, you know, we have CPAPs, we have BiPAPs. So CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. A BiPAP is bi-level positive airway pressure. Um, so these are gonna treat obstructive sleep apnea where you're having trouble with breathing over the course of the night. Um, and there's a lot of different styles of machine. Uh, the biggest thing that comes up is adherence. It's really hard to keep people using these products. Um, sometimes they can be uncomfortable, sometimes they can be loud, but they work, they do their job. Um, so if you're thinking about how this works, it literally pushes air into your lungs and then helps you pull it out. Um, so it is doing the process that your body would be doing mechanically. Um, so there's a great amount of evidence for how beneficial these can be for obstructive sleep apnea, but we do deal with a lot of adherence issues. There's a lot of medications, right? So there's over-the-counter stuff that you can get. I'm not gonna go through the exhaustive list. Um, with melatonin, you can purchase that at any pharmacy, of course. Um, you know, again, it really only benefits some sleep disorders. So if you have jet lag, if you have a circadian rhythm disorder, there is some evidence for it with insomnia in the elderly because melatonin levels are so low at baseline. There's really negligible support for this use of melatonin in kids and in adolescents. Um, unless, again, that adolescent is experiencing delayed sleep phase. Um, if you just have insomnia as an adolescent, um, if you have insomnia even as an early adult or something like that, melatonin is usually that first go-to, but it doesn't typically help that much. The other you know, side of that is that there's very low side effects. So if you're taking it, it's not the end of the world or anything like that. It's just probably not gonna be all that helpful for certain sleep disorders. And the timing piece is really crucial. So you have to time it to when melatonin would usually be rising. And that's hard to figure out. Um, for individuals. You have your benzodiazepines, so your PAMs and your LAMs. Um, so these, <laughs> how I remember them. Um, so you bi these bind to your GABA receptors. They have some sedative qualities, so they're gonna inhibit processes in the body. They also suppress um, slow wave sleep and REM sleep, and they increase your amount of time that you spend in stage two sleep. So these act pretty quickly. So these are a great way to get to sleep, but they have a really short half-life. So if you wake up, you might have trouble getting back to sleep as a result. They can be really habit forming. So these can be super addictive. You can build up tolerance to them. You can experience withdrawal symptoms from them. Um, and you need to be really careful about how they're combined with other substances too. So since this is so sedating, you don't wanna be drinking alcohol, um, for instance, when you're taking a benzo. We have our non-benzodiazepines. So these are Z drugs, typically, uh, Zopaclone, Esopaclone, Ambien, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, clonidine and trazodone are sometimes prescribed in kids. So clonidine is actually a hypertension medication. Um, it's given to kids with ADHD sometimes when they have sleep issues. Um, and it's a, it has some sedative qualities to it. And trazodone is actually an antidepressant. Um, again, it, it's given to kids and adolescents sometimes. It's not entirely clear that they're very helpful for kids and adolescents again, um, but sometimes it'll be an option that doctors go to. So these are in hypnotics, they're unrelated to benzodiazepines, unrelated to other tranquilizers or hypnotics, um, but they do interact with GABA to some extent. So again, are inhibitory. The side effects can be a little concerning. Um, so some people can have sleep state confusion. They can be unaware of if they're asleep or if they're awake. They can engage in sleep behaviors, so sleep walking, sleep talking, sleep eating, sleep shopping, sleep driving. Um, and you may have heard of these things like ambient blackouts, so where people can engage in behaviors that are potentially really dangerous and then not remember them at all in the morning. Um, this isn't necessarily like something that happens for everybody or anything, but it's a side effect to think about. Here's some 
some other medications that are a little bit newer. So modafinil is actually a wake promoting um, agent. So they will prescribe this some, I won't because I'm not a prescriber, but doctors will prescribe this sometimes for uh, shift work disorder or narcolepsy, um, sometimes for obstructive sleep apnea if you're having a lot of sleepiness throughout the day. It's really not entirely clear how it's working. It works on a lot of different neurotransmitters. So it increases histamine, so which is an activating agent. It increases norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Um, it's increasing glutamate, which is again one of our excitatory neurotransmitters. And it's decreasing GABA, our inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's meant to kind of keep people awake, keep them going if they're having a lot of issues with their sleep overnight. There's other alternatives like light therapies. Um, so these are typically used in folks that have like seasonal affective disorder, for instance. Um, but they can be really useful in individuals who have advanced sleep phase syndrome too. So if you're having trouble like staying awake until you really want to go to bed, um, like having some sort of bright light or bright lumens um, can be really helpful to kind of, you know, engage the brain in thinking that it's daytime um, and keeping you up a little bit later. Um, you know, it's really helpful also to just wake up in the morning if you're having trouble getting up and just open your shades. Even if it's a cloudy day, the level of light that comes in can be really wake promoting at that point. There's a lot of herbal supplements that you'll see out there like valerian root, chamomile. Um, it's not entirely clear how beneficial these are. This might be more of like a placebo effect. Um, we need a lot more research to really tell if it's helpful. There can be some individuals who shouldn't take some of these supplements, so it's worth talking to your doctor about. Um, you know, so it can have some negative interactions with some other medications. Um, so it's definitely something you'd want to talk to your PCP about before starting on. And CBD, CBD is huge. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, again, not entirely clear how beneficial CBD might be for people. Um, it can be really relaxing for individuals. It can, you know, potentially um, make you feel more drowsy. Um, people who will have these perceived increases in their sleep quality, so they think they're sleeping better. Um, and that might be important enough. Um, but we do need more research, again, here um, to really be able to know what the benefits are. And, you know, I think it's worth asking yourself at that point when you're thinking about these kinds of things is, do I really need a medication or supplements? Or are there some, like, lifestyle changes that I could make using these sleep hygiene variables um, that could better your sleep? Um, like, I would always suggest trying those first if it's possible. Okay, true or false, before we get into question time. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the treatment of choice for sleep disorders. True, yeah. And, you know, I didn't explicitly state this, but this is the one win that psychology gets over medication. Um, therapy works, and it works really well. Um, so this is actually the thing that uh, your, your internal medicine, your family medicine, your pediatrician should be recommending um, for insomnia for some of those related disorders. And a characteristic of good sleep hygiene may be which of the following? C, yeah, going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, keeping it consistent. Um, so that is all I have. I want to keep time for questions. I know I ran over. Um, so thank you. Test. Uh, could you speak to um, blue spectrum lighting as mm -hmm. a nightlight, you know, for waking up using the restroom at night? Yeah, so blue light um, during the day or at night. Can you say that part again? Sorry. Yes, uh, using a blue spectrum light yeah. as a night light in a bathroom for, um, you know, getting up and going yeah. to the bathroom. Yeah, so you don't have to it. turn, like, the full overhead lighting on. Right. So using some other kind of, like, lower lighting, but blue spectrum kind of light. Um, so the issue with blue spectrum lighting um, that you've probably read to some extent when you, if you've read anything about sleep hygiene variables, is that it is known to potentially affect melatonin levels, so it can suppress the release of melatonin. Um, so in that case, what I typically recommend to my patients is use red light instead. Yeah, yeah, so red light doesn't have the same kinds of effects. Um, so if you're using like a red light, you can plug in, there's red light bulbs that you can pick up. Um, it's not gonna have the same effect on melatonin levels, and your eyes adjust to it more easily. Um, so you're actually gonna get better benefits if you use something like that. Yeah, um, what do you think about maintaining sleep schedules for people who live at high latitudes Ooh. when they don't have those endogenous or exogenous uh, stimuli, don't have good consistency with lighting throughout the seasons? And even like, so like, you know, changes in um, like time zones even, that kind of stuff. So even like the Arctic versus, um, you know, where we live versus like the equator. Is that what you're talking about too? Is, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so changes in latitude across, you know, across the globe, like how can that affect some of these sleep timing things? It's interesting because animals that live in the Arctic, they don't necessarily have a great circadian rhythm. Um, so we know that they are pretty deeply affected by, you know, when they're in a period of time where it's like 24 hours of darkness, that kind of thing. Um, you know, in that case, then melatonin could potentially be more helpful because it's again kind of setting that clock and becoming, you know, setting you up to have that similar sleep time over the course of the day. Um, I don't know of too, too much research comparing those things, though. I'd have to look into it a little bit more, what the recommendations are. Um, it's a really good question, because, yeah, they, I mean, even here, think about it, like, you know, at 5 o'clock, it becomes dark all of a sudden, and that's very different from what it is in the summer, or even a few days before. Um, so it's a good question. Yeah, I'm not we have a question sorry. from upstairs yeah. in the overflow room. Um, did you say that restless leg syndrome is a disorder? Yes. Um, so restless leg syndrome is unfortunate, and it can be really debilitating for sleep onset, typically. Um, so we do, we can diagnose it. Um, it's typically related to like low iron levels. Um, so you might be able to supplement it with like supplemental iron. It would be something you'd have to talk to your, um, your providers about. Um, but it, there, there is a diagnosis for it. Um, and it can really or really detriment um, sleep onset, typically. It slows down your ability to get to sleep because it's so debilitating. The, the feeling that you have to get up and move is essentially what it is in your legs, typically. Um, so there are treatments for it, too. Could you speak to alternatives to CPAP, uh, such as oral appliances for treatment of snoring and sleep apnea? So and there are, yeah, there are other alternatives to CPAP. Um, so, you know, in some cases they'll do surgeries, for instance, to remove the adenoids or tonsils. Like if there's a really obvious structural kind of issue that's related to your snoring or to your inability to breathe regularly during sleep. Um, I don't know too, too much else about the orthodontics because I don't really treat like sleep apnea specifically. I'll deal with the adherence issues with CPAP, especially with kids. Um, but I'm not too familiar with the other like orthodontic kind of, um, kinds of features that you can get to help with that. When you say um, that maintaining a consistent sleep schedule means going to sleep at the same time every mm -hmm. night, how much of a window is there? Like, That's do you have really half an hour, <laughs> an hour? Yeah, it's a really good question. So how much of a window is there for that consistent sleep schedule? Um, you know, I would recommend sticking within like 30 to 45 minutes. It is variable per person, right? So there's a lot of different components that alter your sleep schedule and alter your circadian rhythm. Um, so it is going to depend person to person, but I would start out with trying to keep it as regimented as you can, and then you can always give yourself some wiggle room and see how it goes. So say, oh, I'm going to go to bed 15 minutes later tonight, or I'm going to sleep in a little bit, and see how your body reacts to it. If your body has a pretty negative reaction, then that would tell me you need to stick to that sleep schedule. Um, but you can kind of fiddle with it a little bit and experiment. Um, so regarding circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. if you find that your circadian rhythm is off, you're, you're 3 p.m., you're getting tired, 3 a.m., you're waking up, for mm -hmm. example, is there something that can be done to shift it back to a more normal rhythm? Yeah, so if you're, like, getting up, uh, so, so, so say that, like, scenario again. I just you're want to make sure. 3 in the afternoon mm -hmm. is when you're sort of plummeting, mm -hmm. and, you know, all the things that should be happening at 8 or 9 or yeah. happening at 3, and then 3 in the morning is is mimicking what should be happening at seven in the morning, mm -hmm. so you're kind of off. Is there something that can be done to get the circadian rhythm back to where it should be? Yeah, so what you're describing is more like that advanced sort of phase sort of thing. So if you're feeling tired around like 3 p.m. and then you're waking up as a result like much, much earlier in the morning, maybe even like one or two in the morning or something like that, um, light therapy can be really helpful for that. So exposing yourself to blue light or you know even the sunlight, that kind of stuff, um, later in the day, so around the time you feel drowsy. Because um, again, like around 3 p.m., you actually might be feeling that way just at baseline because your alerting signals have gone down a little bit. So doing something activating, doing something that's going to be added to your schedule that's going to make you more um, active and alert can be really helpful. But then the light piece can be really helpful too because it again kind of mimics and tells the body that, hey, you should be awake right now. This should be what you're dealing with. Um, and then it can push it back some. Hi. Yeah. Um, do you know if the main ingredient in a typical uh, sleep aid, such as something from CVS or mm -hmm. Tylenol PM, interrupts the sleep cycle that flushes away, apparently, I read this in Matthew Walter's Why We Sleep book, mm -hmm. um, fl interferes with the flushing away of plaque and therefore could be affecting 
me and getting early Alzheimer's. I think I read that book a yeah. few years ago, so now I can't remember totally. That's okay. So yeah, are some of these sleep aids, are they actually like affecting how we can flush away plaque and tangles and the kinds of things that are related to dementia and Alzheimer's and those kinds of things? There is some evidence for that. I'm not entirely up to speed on it either. Um, but there is some evidence to suggest that using some of those sleep aids can actually be detrimental. It does at higher doses and with extended use change sometimes how you go through sleep. So if you're not getting the stages of sleep that you're supposed to be getting or spending as much time in them as you should be getting and that architecture changes enough, then yeah, I could see how that could you know, change how we're flushing out toxins, change how we're changing the brain and recovering the brain through the night. Um, so I'm sure there is evidence. I can't off the top of my head remember exactly what it is either, but I have seen those associations before, yeah. Oh, back row there. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sense that it's a fairly common problem that people, that some people will go to sleep pretty easily, mm -hmm. but then like in the middle of the night they'll wake up and then there is a feeling of anxiety about being, being able to go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I read an article someplace where in pre-industrial times that um, it was common for people to have actually two periods of sleep, mm -hmm. one in which they went to bed and they slept for a while and they got up and they actually engaged in some activities mm -hmm. and then took another uh, period of sleep and that was m considered normal. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could comment upon that idea and also whether it's uh, wise to, uh, w when you're in that situation where you wake up in the middle of the night, you're feeling anxious, should you get up and start doing stuff? Mm -hmm. Or should you kind of try to meditate yourself back to sleep? Or, I mean, yeah. what's the best approach to that situation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so to repeat the first one, so like in pre-industrial times, there was more of this like biphasic sleep is what we called it. So yeah, you would have one consolidated chunk to kind of get up and do things, and then you have another consolidated chunk of sleep. Um, you know, it, there's some people that operate in that manner. Again, there's some variability here in terms of what your circadian rhythm looks like. So what I'm talking about is very much the typical average kind of adult or um, you know, kid or older adult, whatever age group. Um, so there are some people that are perfectly functional running on a biphasic schedule like that. Um, if it works with your work schedule or if it works with what you're doing on a daily basis, then hey, I mean, I think it's probably possible to engage in that. I think it's just hard to probably find those scenarios potentially nowadays where that is going to work out necessarily. Um, the other piece about what do you do if you wake up and you're feeling really anxious um, and you know what should you get out of bed? Should you kind of like reset basically um, if you wake up overnight? Yes, you should get out of bed. Um, so that's actually a part of stimulus control when we're doing um, cognitive behavioral therapy um, for insomnia is that we'll actually tell you if you can't get back to sleep within like 10 or 15 minutes or so, get up out of bed, do something that's like lightly activating that's just gonna keep you awake for a period of time until you feel drowsy again. Um, so that could mean that you know you go and like sit very straight. You know, we'll tell people to sit in a chair and kind of like lean forward basically because that reduces drive to sleep. Um, for a period of time and you know maybe like do some reading for a little bit um, do some other like light low light kind of activity until you start to feel drowsy again and then you can try again um, and if you don't fall asleep in like 10 or 15 minutes then you know you can get back out again if it's anxiety then I often recommend that people have like a worry journal or something that they can like quickly write down like what are the things that I'm thinking about let me get them out of my head and then I can promise to revisit that in the morning. Like I will deal with those worries. I will have my worry time at some other time. That does not, you know, impact my sleep or in the middle of my sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. You mentioned reading again just mm -hmm. now. I was saddened to see it at, in the uh, list of uh, sleep hygiene as mm -hmm. something not not favorable to do to get you to sleep. But I'm I'm a reader, and all my life I've read before going oh, to sleep. Yeah. So could you just expand some more on reading, on why it was even Yeah, it shouldn't have, reading shouldn't be in there. Reading is fine before bed, um, especially if you're not using a tablet or something. Like if you're reading a, an actual book, like a physical book, that's a great like bedtime routine kind of activity. Um, do not read in bed, that's what it is. Yeah, so you shouldn't be reading in bed. That's a good point, thank you for, for revisiting that. I was trying to figure out why that would have been on there. That's weird, I love reading before bed, that's great. Um, yeah, it's a quiet activity. It's just doing it outside of bed is the more important thing. And in part, because depending on what you're reading, like if you're somebody who's reading like some just like general novels or maybe historical fiction or something like that, 
Like maybe that's not that big of a deal, it doesn't stress you out or something. If you're reading like a thriller, then you might be stressing yourself out in bed, or like a crime drama, you know, that kind of stuff. So again, these are like, these they may or may not apply, right? So if you're reading something that relaxes you, that soothes you, go for it, that's totally fine. Thank you for clarifying that, that's important. <laughs> Hi. Mm. Um, so when we were going over um, the EEG waves and like yeah. the different um, stages of sleep, I was wondering which stage correlates to the lowest brain activity. And then furthermore, I'm sure we've all experienced like when you come out of sleep, you're more alert and aware versus um, when you like wake up groggily, mm -hmm. if any you know waves, whether it be delta or theta, correspond to that, or like different stages of sleep. Yeah, um, so the stage of sleep that has like the lowest brain activity would be deep sleep or stage three sleep. That's when we see those big delta waves. There's still definitely activity going on, but the wave amplitude is much higher, the frequency of them is much, much lower. Um, when you're talking about like optimal time to get out of sleep is basically what that other question is. So yeah, you know, when you wake up out of deep sleep, you can sometimes feel like sleep inertia. So you feel like that grogginess. You feel like you're just really struggling to transition. Um, there are some apps that claim that they can like wake you at the appropriate time. There's one called Sleep on Cue. Um, there's a couple other ones that'll say like, hey, I can wake you up out of stage one sleep. Um, you know, when you're the, the most close to being awake anyways. Um, it's really unlikely that they can do that because you need EEG sensors to be able to accurately estimate that. Um, but, you know, again, once you get into a consistent sleep schedule, we do see that people tend to wake up maybe a couple minutes before their alarm and they feel okay. Um, so it's really about hitting that consistency more than anything else. Yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, does menopause affect mm -hmm. sleep mm -hmm. or is it just because you're aging? Oh, um, it's both. <laughs> um, menopause and aging, yeah. Um, just to answer that quickly, um, you know, you experience a lot of like complexities that come along with aging that really interfere with sleep. Um, and you know, menopause can be really uncomfortable. It can make your temperature rise. It can, you know, how you have a lot of things that you experience that really throw off your natural sleep cycle. So yeah, it can definitely have some effect. It, it just seems like I never recovered and went back to mm -hmm. uh, being able to sleep as well as I did before menopause. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my other question is frequency of having to get up and use the bathroom. You mm -hmm. said not too frequently. Well, what's I, too frequently? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're not pregnant. No, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it happens for a lot of people, regardless of like age or regardless of uh, pregnancy status or menopause or whatever. Um, you know, it does, it, it's not a big deal as long as you're able to get back to sleep more quick, like quickly afterwards. If it's really starting to interrupt it, then we might work on like a, hygi or a hydration schedule that will make you less likely to be getting up at night. Um, but it's definitely a problem for a lot of people and can be interfering in sleep. And you want to avoid those big wake-ups as much as you can. Um, anything that's going to keep you awake for more than like 10 minutes, something like that, yeah, that's going to cause you to be awake overnight in like a meaningful way. Yeah, frequency too, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, and that additively can add up to potentially like an hour or two hours of your night of sleep that you're losing as a result. Is, so if it's for like restroom use, then we would work on a... Mm-hmm. You know, when we're doing like CBTI, again, the big thing is that we do have you get up out of bed. We don't want you in bed and trying to sleep because trying to sleep is antithetical to sleep. You're not going to fall asleep if you're trying. Um, so you have to build up some of that drowsiness. So doing some of those like low engaging kinds of activities that might make you feel sleepy, reading a boring book, that kind of stuff, um, then that can be really helpful. And then, you know, if there's something that we can otherwise like cue to those things, like some other kinds of behaviors that are related to it or some timing that might be related to it, then there might be some other things that can be done in treatment. Um, but it's, you know, it's totally dependent on that person's sleep diary and their scheduling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my question is about an 11 year old who suddenly started sleepwalking. Yeah. Is that sleeping really? Are they really asleep? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, sleepwalking, sleep terrors can happen in really young kids too. Sleep terrors are terrifying for the person who is witnessing them. Your kid will never remember them. Um, so you know, it's it's more of a like management issue at that point. Um, it typically goes away towards the end of childhood and by adolescence. We'll see the sleepwalking, sleep talking, a lot of those things diminish those sleep behaviors. Um, but in the meantime, making sure that your kid doesn't have easy access to stairs, you know, doesn't have easy access to open windows, um, you know, anything that might make them trip, make them fall, make them injure themselves, you kind of have to try to minimize those as best as you can. Mm -hmm. I saw on the screen you had a, a reference to meadow larks and night owls. Yeah. And as long as I can remember, I've been the latter. I've mm -hmm. been a night owl. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid, I sleepwalked. I was, uh, my mother um, was a, a nurse who really believed in good sleep hygiene. Yeah. I was in bed two hours before my, you know, my, my <laughs> classmates were. Yeah. I was, I was always a sleepyhead. Uh, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter what I did. As, as a six-year-old, I was falling asleep at the dinner table. Yeah. It, it might be normal for a two-year-old to fall asleep in their mashed potatoes, but a six- or seven-year-old, it's not too much. Probably doesn't need to happen at Probably that point, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, been on uh, CPAP therapy for about 10 mm -hmm. years now for sleep apnea and doing yeah. well with that. Um, but no matter how hard I have tried, I can't seem to break that circadian rhythm and yeah. I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm just like okay I'm a night owl I'm yeah. approaching retirement fine I'll go to bed at one and get up at ten what's the problem yeah except that it is it it creates a problem in functioning you know mm -hmm. with the rest of the world who yeah. seems to be more awake in the morning mm -hmm. is this just a lifetime of bad habits is this an internal clock that mm -hmm. I'm fighting against and is there anything I should try or just Except, I mean, uh, so the question is related to like if you are a night owl or if you are a morning lark, essentially, can you change those things or can you alter them or what is it related to? Um, we primarily think of this as being related to melatonin. So melatonin is driving this. Um, like when you're releasing melatonin and when it's at its highest level, those kinds of things are driving that. Um, again, because that's really our timing switch. So when we kind of start the other cascade of signals that makes us sleepy or not, um, this is the thing that kind of times that. So you could potentially use melatonin to move your sleep phase up a little earlier so that you could try to kind of match it to either what your family needs or, you know, to whatever the general society needs are. Um, but, you know, there's also something great about just diving in <laughs> and saying this is what my life is and this is what my body wants to do. Um, because there is, there's just people who classify like really deeply into that night owl kind of um, classification or people that are like, I got to get up at four in the morning or else it just drives my day in the wrong direction. Um, so, you know, if you are trying to just steer into that skid, then I recommend trying it out. Um, but there are potentially things that your doctor might recommend in terms of melatonin use, in terms of early light therapy, that kind of thing. So, you know, if you have um, advanced phase, then we think about using light in the evening. But if you're thinking about delayed phase or night owl kind of, uh, kind of behaviors, then we'd say use light early in the morning. Yeah, expose yourself to like 30 minutes or so of light. Yeah, just literally sit in front of that light, you know? <laughs> All right, thank you. Oh, sure. Okay, yeah.